Hi everyone, we are having a very effective webinar series under the theme of industrial water and wastewater management and challenges and solutions. So today we are going to have the fifth webinar and that's going to be focusing on a very much timely important topic that is on sensing digitization and water. So before getting into the webinar, usually we would like to remind you a couple of instructions. So please make sure to mic, uh, mute your mic, microphones and switch off of, of your cameras as well. So if you got any interesting question or comment, please uh, put up all them into the chat box or you got another facility for Q&A section. Then our panelists will be very much keen to respond to you during the session. If they miss anything, they will come back, contact you later. So the webinar series was arrange together with the by the joint research and demonstration center of water technology under the ministry of water supply sri lanka together with the university of pera Adenia, especially the faculty of engineering and rmit australia so this is as i said so the webinar is done with the joint research and demonstration center let me just introduce joint research and demonstration center as you see over there we got a facility where we have advanced testing kept on the on the, the right hand corner and then uh, we are getting the administration block and the accommodation facility as well. This is a full fledged facility we got the piloting area as well as for the lecturing and all uh, uh, administrative uh, activities we got the facility over there. So let's have the video on JRDC. In year 2018, September 28, Joint Research and Demonstration Center for Water Technology (JRDC) started construction, marking the official approval for the establishment of Joint Center for Water and Technology Research and Demonstration. The China-Sri Lanka Joint Research and Demonstration Center for Water Technology has come into effect after signing of a MOU between both countries in year 2015. I believe that both Chinese party as well as Sri Lankan party has worked hard to understand the special objectives of this project and come to an agreement which can lead for smooth project execution. Sri Lanka project team consists of Ministry of Water Supply, Ministry of Health, National Water Supply and Drainage Board, NWSDB, and experts from the University of Peradeniya. It formed a corporation scheme to integrate resources from the governmental agencies, enterprises, universities, and research institutes of both countries, and explored a corporation model of human capacity building, cooperation development of technologies, implementation of solutions by enterprises. The cooperation team covers interdisciplinary high-level experts from different cooperations, proficient in water sciences, geology, medical sciences, and public health. Strengthening our historical relations between China and Sri Lanka. This time, the Chinese government has come forward to help us in establishing a research and demonstration laboratory in Peradeni. As a result, we have now initiated this uh, several MOUs we have signed. I feel JRDC will be a low force to connect East and West of the world. So we want to make Sri Lanka in a very, very important position in Indian Ocean. I think Sri Lanka and China collaboration is lifetime. From shore to shore, it seems, wide at high tide, before fair wind a single sail is lifting, Sri Lanka Joint Research and Demonstration Center for Water Technology aims to be a global partner in water, environment, and health research, offering a platform to promote north-south and south-south dialogue and a good model of science and technology cooperation under the Belt and Road Initiative. JRDC consists of high technology analytical facilities covering water, environment, and health-related aspects. The Volatile Orignic Laboratory is mainly dedicated for volatile pesticides, disinfection byproducts as well and other volatile organic residues. Inorganic laboratory is mainly dedicated for heavy metals, anion, and cation analysis. 
Non-volatile organic laboratory is capable of analyzing organic pesticides and residuals. Moreover, there is a laboratory for the biological parameter analysis. Not only that, but also JRDC have a high technology conference facilities as well as accommodations for researchers. We cordially invite you to join with us. Make water clean and sweet. Today we are going to talk about sensing, digitization and water. And I am very much privileged to welcome the moderator for today. He is Professor Janaka Bandar Ekanayaka. He is the Chair Professor of Electrical and Electronic Engineering of the University of Peradeniya. He obtained his B.Sc. Engineering with the first class honours from the University of Peradeniya in 1990 and the PhD from University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology UK in 1995. He is a visiting professor of Cardiff University UK and honorary professor of the University of Wollongong, Australia. So Professor Ekanayak is a fellow of IEEE USA, IET UK and IESA Sri Lanka. So he is the only Sri Lankan to hold fellowships of the three major electrical engineering professional bodies. He has been a Royal Society and Commonwealth Fellow at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology UK in 1997 and 2001. He is also the chartered engineer, a chartered engineer of UK and Sri Lanka. So it's my privilege to welcome you, sir, for the event today. Thank you, Dr. Veragoda, for that kind introduction. So let's uh, move on with the, the main uh, uh, event today. Uh, so uh, we have three eminent speakers to talk about uh, uh, the sensing digitization related to water. And our first speaker is uh, Professor Anand Michel uh, from RMIT. Uh, let me uh, read his. Uh, can can everybody see the screen? Because there was a, uh, somebody was telling that uh, he cannot see the see the screen. Can somebody confirm whether you can see the screen, please? Oh, thank thanks. Uh, so let me uh, introduce Sanan. Uh, he's a distinguished professor in the field of photonics and electromagnetics at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at RMIT, Australia. Uh, he's the director of the Micro Nano Research Facility and the director of the Integrated Photonics and Application Center, uh, creating photonic chip technologies for applications in communications, defense, biomedical, and environmental sensing. Uh, he receives his Bachelor of Technology degree with honors from the uh, Macquarie University, uh, Sydney, in 1993, and received his PhD from RMIT in 2000. Uh, his uh, areas of research and consultant expertise are in the field of integrated optics at Fortnics, uh, Fortnix signal processing, lab on chip uh, technologies and my, uh, microfluids and micro fabrication and microsystems. He has co-authored over 500 research, research publications in high profile outlets, including Nature, Nature Medicine and Advanced Material. He has supervised more than 50 PhDs and uh, postdoctoral fellows. We are fortunate to have him with us so let me stop sharing and uh, pass over to uh, Dr. Professor Anand to start, uh, go along with this presentation. Over to you, Professor. Many thanks. Um, let me just try and um, share my screen. Um, all right. Okay, let me give that in presenter view. 
All right, so hopefully you can, you can all see that. Um, many thanks for inviting me uh, to come and speak today. Um, as um, uh, uh, Professor um, uh, Ekin, Ekinyaki um, uh, introduced me, um, I'm a researcher in integrated photonics. Um, I, and I know a fair bit about uh, microfluidics. And so hopefully through my talk, I'll sort of show you how we're bringing these two technologies together um, in a way that could be of use for, um, for sort of sensing in, in the context of uh, water management. Um, but firstly, um, I uh, just wanted to introduce my role as the director of the Micro Nano Research Facility. So um, in, in the heart of Melbourne, so right in the middle of the CBD, we actually have a fully functional uh, clean room for microfabricating uh, chips. Um, so we, we do a lot of research in um, patterning uh, uh, chips that are used for electronics and photonics, and particularly with an emphasis on sensors. Um, there's a lot of work that's done on uh, gas sensing and, and other types of sensing. And so um, there's an example, let me just switch my pointer into a laser pointer. Um, uh, a particular example here is actually a gas sensor that is the size of a pill and you can swallow it and it actually measures all of the gas uh, in your gut and has um, all of the electronics and uh, a power supply and actually a communication system so that it can report out the, the gas that it's measuring in real time um, over a period of about two days. And so this is an excellent tool for um, diagnosing disorders in, in people's guts, but it could also, you can imagine how you may use a sensor like this in, in a, a water treatment plant, for example, where you could put it into, into a water tank or, a, or a, um, a processing plant and actually sort of measure the, the, the sort of contents of the, of the water um, over a period of days autonomously. So this is, this is just an example of the sort of work that has been done um, by my colleagues, not by me. Um, this, this picture below is actually the focus of what I will get to later today. So this is the lab on a chip research that, that, that we do. And there's many other researchers working on all sorts of other interesting materials and, 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 and sensors in particular. So my own research team is, is, is a little bit strange. So um, the, the research center that I, that I started uh, maybe a year ago is the Integrated Photonics and Applications Center. And um, really its history goes back uh, maybe 20 years. Um, so this is back to when I uh, had just graduated from my PhD, where we were working on um, uh, very small chips, uh, microchips, um, but they, they guide light. Um, so laser light goes through these chips. Um, normally uh, these chips would have electronic signals on them, um, but the, the particular chips that I work on sort of um, interface electronics with, with laser light so that you can have, um, for example, uh, this is the sort of uh, chip that used to be used for um, uh, optical fiber communication. So being able to transmit um, uh, information across optical fibers. Um, there's a lot of other applications for these, including um, old uh, cable television and also for radar systems for, for, um, for, for defense. Um, and, that, and we did a lot of work in those areas as well. But at the same time, um, my team also does a lot of work on microfluidics, and I'll show you a few more examples um, uh, beyond this one. But this is a, a chip that we made that actually was designed to mimic a uh, damaged blood vessel. And so this uh, very bright pink fluid here is actually blood that's been stained with a fluorescent dye. And what we're doing is we're drawing it through this chip out here. Um, and uh, in here, there's a very small um, uh, blockage that, that the blood is pushed through and it looks like a, like a, a blocked artery. And so we can study um, how the blood functions in, in, under those sorts of environments. And so this, this can be very useful for understanding blood clots and how they form, but also drugs that you can use to treat them. And so this is um, uh, some work that we had published in Nature Medicine back in 2009. Um, I've also been uh, a chief investigator with uh, Australian Research Council um, Center of Excellence called KUDOS particularly looking at high-speed communications, and more recently have become the director of the Micro Nano Research Facility, which we use to sort of make these chips. So my team works in a number of different areas, and um, we particularly work in high-speed data communications. 
And this is really what's driving integrated photonics today. Um, and it's particularly trying to get very, very high speed links between uh, uh, computers and data centers. This is not very relevant uh, directly to uh, water, water um, monitoring, but it is really important for a lot of the cloud systems for doing artificial intelligence and sort of recognizing, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of contaminants in water and, and, and correlating lots of different locations. Um, uh, we, we do a lot of work in this area. We also do a lot of work in sensing, um, particularly sensing for defense. But um, as, I'll, as I'll talk about a little bit in a moment, um, uh, again, this may not be directly relevant for, to water quality monitoring, but it is important. We do a lot of work on, for example, gyroscopes and movement sensors, which are important for um, drones that may, and keeping drones stable and allowing them to image, which could be useful for for studying waterways and, and actually getting very precise locations of, of where you're taking water samples from. But the thing I think that we do that is most relevant is uh, biosensing. And so um, here we use photonic chips um, and we functionalize them. And I'll talk about, about this in a little bit more detail in a moment, um, and then use microfluidics to basically sense even down at the single molecule level, um, all sorts of things in the water. So, um, I've only got a slide or two on data communications and uh, some of the uh, sort of gyroscopes and sensors we do, but just to give you an idea of the sort of work that we do. So um, my team that works in data communications, um, this is an example of one of our photonic chips. And so you can see this is a very, very tiny chip. Um, it's smaller than your fingernail. This in the background here is an Australian $2 coin. Um, and that also, that's probably about the size of your fingernail. So this is really tiny, very, very tiny indeed. And on that chip, there's this tiny little ring. And so this ring is less than a millimeter, but that ring um, we use to actually generate um, enough laser lines, um, more than a hundred um, laser lines, which we could use um, each one of those as a communications channel, an ultra high speed communications channel. Um, my, my laboratory is actually based in uh, the Melbourne CBD. So this is actually the, the Melbourne city uh, district here um, and RMIT is here, but we've actually got a fiber link that goes all the way out to another suburb um, at Monash University in Clayton and comes back again. And what we were able to do was actually use the, um, the laser lines that are produced by this, um, by this ring and actually measure um, the um, uh, the highest uh, data capacity link um, uh, ever demonstrated from a single chip. And that was done in the middle of last year. So we, we, we um, got a lot of um, uh, press coverage for that. So it was covered on the BBC and actually over a thousand other news outlets. Um, and so we're pretty proud of that. And I, I do want to uh, draw attention here to uh, Professor Dave Moss from Swinburne University and uh, Bill Corcoran here from Monash University. And the three of us were, uh, are here in, in my lab in um, RMIT. Um, so that, that we're very proud of that. Um, we, we also, as I mentioned, do a lot of work in sensing and metrology. And um, uh, we particularly, again, about mid last year, um, partnered with a company called Advanced Navigation to explore um, uh, trying to use our photonic chips to make um, very precise gyroscopes. And um, the gyroscopes that we that we make, this is actually a drone, um, and that drone has uh, a gyroscope here uh, built into it. And this is a pretty high-end drone. This is probably about hundred thousand dollars worth of worth of drone. And what that drone does is it flies around and uses um, a laser rangefinder to basically sort of map to millimeter precision. Um, uh, different surfaces. So it sort of does a lot of um, uh, surveying and, and, and trying to sort of map uh, where things are, but it can be used for um, inspecting infrastructure and sort of measuring, um, you know, whether railway lines are, be, are having trees growing over them or, or things like that. But our component, our chip actually goes in, in, in this region here. And our intent is to try and shrink that, shrink this unit here from, from this size down to something the size of your fingernail. And so we, we, we're working on that at the moment. And we believe this could be useful for having uh, very precise and autonomous drones for monitoring um, uh, waterways. So now the, the part of this talk that's really most relevant, I think, to, to water quality monitoring is, is, is this pattern. It's um, on photonic biosensing. So um, uh, just a little bit of background on photonic biosensing. Our photonic chips guide light um, and, and light is essentially trapped on the surface in 
um, essentially something like an optical fiber, a, a film of glass here. And the light is actually trapped by inter total internal reflection bouncing between this high index glass and, and the low index glass on the substrate. Um, but some of the light actually extends up into, for example, the water here. And if we um, attach uh, selective molecules to the surface, and so here are illustrated um, antibodies, um, but we can, we can make a number of different types of selective uh, chemicals here and attach them to the surface, then um, the, the light will actually be able to detect um, that those uh, things are there because it'll be slowed down a little bit. There'll be this little bit of extra refractive index there that will slow the light down. But even if there's other uh, molecules that these antibodies attach, and so you can see here, these are triangles attaching to the surface, the light will be slowed down a little bit more as those things arrive. And the laser light is, is of sufficiently high quality and the chips are uh, sensitive enough that they can actually detect individual molecules attaching to the surface here. And so the way we use turn this into a sensor is basically we have um, an interferometer. So we have laser light comes in here, gets split in two. Um, one arm goes through a uh, channel that is exposed to the environment. And so here you might imagine water running over the surface. Um, and the other arm is, is protected. And then they're joined together again. And if they experience the same phase shift, they'll add up in phase and it'll be bright at the output. Um, but if there's a phase shift on this arm, then as, as material accumulates on the arm, the two arms will get out of phase and the output will gradually go dark. And so you can sort of see here that you'll get a sinusoidal response as you accumulate more material because the phase between the two arms are going in and out of phase um, periodically. And so if you can detect this small shift in the response, then you can actually detect how many molecules arrived at the surface. And, and you can indeed actually get um, single molecule uh, level uh, sensitivity on a chip like this. So this is actually a picture of one of the chips uh, from my lab. And so there's, there's two aspects to, to, to look at here. Uh, one aspect is the, the dark gray um, box uh, un underneath here. So you can, you can actually just see that um, there that I'm outlining with my laser pointer. Um, actually, that's the silicon chip. And so this is actually a microscope image of that silicon chip. And you can see on there, there are many, many, many individual sensors. And each one of those sensors looks like this. Um, and the light comes in here, is split in two. One arm on the sensing arm goes round and round and round this coil and then comes back out this side. The other arm is protected. And then when they join together, they either interfere constructively or destructively, depending on how much material is attached to the surface here. And you either get a bright or dark signal coming out here. So that's actually how the sensor works. But also note on the top here, there is this uh, microfluidics. So we actually have like all each of these little traces here is actually a pump or a valve or, um, and we have the ability to, to actually perform um, assays and, and put different chemicals over the surface of the chip and then run water or whatever we're trying to sense over the surface of the chip and we can filter and pump, pump that as we go. So we, we, we've actually pioneered some technology to print these microfluidics and we can injection mold them very, very cheaply um, and make um, these sorts of chips. These chips can be made if you make large volumes of them for even only a few dollars. And similarly with the microfluidics. So for you know, ten to hundred dollars, you could actually make a fully automated sensor using these sorts of technologies. So here's an example of um, how they work. Um, we have um, the light comes in through uh, this this optical fiber and comes back out through this optical fiber, and that can address any one of those uh, twenty or thirty sensors on the chip. Um, and the same thing with the microfluidics; they can actually selectively choose which of those twenty or thirty sensors we're going to interact with. And what you can see here is just a, a sort of an example of the sort of measurement that you might get. So um, if you have, you have a, a baseline, so this is where the, the sensor starts out, then you introduce some, um, some water with a different refractive index, for example, you'll see that there's a phase shift and then you'll end up with um, a different number at the end here. And so the, the measurement is actually um, the phase shift from here to here and then from here to here. So if you look at the difference between what you started with and what you end up with, that's how much the refractive index changed. Um, th this is, we, we usually calibrate things by changing, putting different refractive index fluids through like um, 
uh, alcohol and water have different refractive indices, so we can put those through. But if you actually want to use it for sensing, what you're doing is you're actually measuring molecules arriving at the surface. And so what we do here is we have a baseline. And then as molecules arrive at the surface, you'll see they, they gradually accumulate over time. And some of them will just, some of them are molecules you don't want to detect. Um, they just rest on the surface. Then you wash, the, wash them away and only the molecules that are actually bound to the antibodies that you're interested in stay. And you'll see, so here is actually a, a difference between the baseline and what you end up with. And that's how many molecules actually stuck to the surface due to the antibodies. And so this is the way you do um, selective sensing. Now you can functionalize each of those sensors, each of those 30 sensors with a different antibody or a different selective molecule. So you can measure 30 different things at once and you can adjust the sensitivity right down to the individual molecule level. So um, th these are, these are um, uh, the possibilities with, with these chips. So a specific example that, that I, I'd like to bring to your attention is this uh, Bravo project. And I've only got three or four more slides, so I'll, I'll be finished up very, very soon. Um, we were involved at the very tail end of this project, but the idea was to use a, um, uh, a sequence of buoys in the ocean. And um, our collaborators in Barcelona um, actually did a lot of these measurements um, to actually measure the quality of seawater. Um, and so we were asked to help them to develop an automated system for sampling seawater and measuring actually um, antibiotics. And so this is uh, just an example, a picture that I've pulled out of a very recent uh, review article um, looking at the uh, impact of farming um, on uh, antibiotics in, in coastal seawater. And so the point here is that um, different farms will use antibiotics as part of their farming practices, but the wastewater will go into the rivers and then that will flow out into the sea. And there can be a significant amount of antibiotics actually in the sea and it can sort of impact um, the, the, uh, the sea environment there and eventually end up actually influencing people swimming in the ocean or eating the food that comes out of the ocean. So um, it's important to be able to measure uh, antibiotics in the ocean. Um, and um, with our sensors, they're sensitive enough to be able to measure even one or two molecules of, of, of antibiotics per, per, you know, in very small volumes of uh, seawater. So this is a picture of a chip. Um, and if you wanted to read more about it, you can read more about um, this in this Lab on a Chip paper um, that we published a, a few years ago. This is a, an example of one of our automated chips. Um, this is the sensor channel. So this goes off to our sensor and this is a waste channel. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of different reservoirs here with a valve control and a pump. And so what we can do is we can kind of select different processes, put the seawater in one valve and some, some chemicals to, to buffer, to wash out and a reference and maybe um, even functionalize the chips with antibodies um, using some of these valves. So that's um, uh, the automated uh, chip. This is an example of it being used and so you can see here's the baseline. Then we put a sample of seawater in and you can see the refractive index changes a lot when we put the, sam the sample in. But then um, once the bulk refractive index has changed, you can see that there's actually an interaction with the surface. And then you take the sample out and the refractive index drops and, and then you wash out. And you, see, you can see there's a difference between the level here and the baseline here. And that's actually your measurement. So that's, that's how much antibiotics we actually picked up um, on the surface. Then we actually have the ability on chip with uh, some of these other reservoirs to actually wash away the antibiotics that were collected. Um, so this is a surface regeneration and we can actually return to the baseline that we started with here. So we, we, we're ready to take another sample maybe in a day's time. Um, and you can use the same chip over and over and over again um, to sample um, automatically the, the seawater. So, um, that's um, just a particular example of uh, one of the many, many projects that we've been working on, but it's something that I think is quite um, uh, interesting for uh, water management. So um, some, some points that I'd want to make, you can selectively functionalize for almost anything. So, you, you know, we've done viruses, bacteria, um, D human DNA, you can measure for particular DNA markers, um, RNA, um, pharmaceuticals like, um, um, uh, like uh, antibiotics or you know antidepressants or anything else in the, in the water, and you can even measure for you know proteins and and, and other things in, in as biomarkers. So just about anything you can you can multiplex um, uh, you know tens to hundreds of, of of tests on a single chip. Um, so it's quite possible to be measuring a hundred different things um, on a chip. 
um, you can quickly reconfigure it. It's the same chip. All you're changing is the particular selective chemical that you're putting on the surface. So if you want to adjust the sensor for a particular uh, marker that you're interested in, it's very easy. Within a week or two, we could um, make a prototype. Um, it's robust and automatic. Um, it, it can operate for weeks on, on its own um, and can be made um, pretty cheaply. So we could imagine scaling this up to a volume for, for deployment. And the particular thing that I think is a, an op unique opportunity here is the ability to have complex microfluidics. So you can, you can actually start, we, we have done work with whole blood where we've actually had to filter out the serum and, and uh, uh, process that. So I'm, I'm, and, and also with seawater actually taking raw seawater and filtering out um, all of the large particles and even some of the chemicals so that you can really be looking at the particular molecules that you're interested in. Um, my email is here. Uh, you can also read more about us on our website. Um, I'm on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn, and I think that is my 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anand, for that uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, we will meet you again during the Q&A session at, uh, towards the end. Uh, so uh, please, if you have any questions, please type your question on the chat box. So I'm going to move on to the next presentation. Uh, the, the presenter is somebody I know very well. We work together, uh, Dr. Vijit Herat. Uh, the Dr. Vijit Herat, let me also share his... Uh, slide with you. So that's Vijita. Uh, he's attached to uh, the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at University of Peradeniya. Uh, he, he receives his uh, engineer, BSc engineering degree with first class honors from the same university uh, in 1992. Uh, his MS degree uh, in electrical and computer engineering from University of Miami, USA. Then the PhD from University of uh, Paderborn, Germany in 2009. Uh, then he returned to Peradeniya uh, and he has been uh, working uh, in the department as a senior lecturer. And he's also the, the current director of the Center of Engineering Research and Postgraduate Studies. Uh, his research uh, interests include uh, remote sensing, spectral imaging, computational uh, epidemiology, and optical fiber communication. Uh, he's a senior member of IEEE and a member of the Optical Society and the member of the IESL Sri Lanka. Uh, he has published more than seven peer-reviewed journal articles and more than 740 peer-reviewed conference papers. Uh, he also supervised seven masters and two PhD students. Uh, so over to you, uh, Vijita. I was informed that uh, it's a recorded video, but Vijita is with us. Uh, he will join at the Q&A session. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you, where you are joining from. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this uh, webinar series for inviting me to be a partner of it. And I also would like to thank uh, Professor Mitchell of RMIT, Professor Ekranak of University of Pera, Denia, and Mr. Fernando of Yara Valley Water for being partners of this. Uh, webinar on sensing, digitizing, and water 4.0. So the topic of my presentation today is uh, sensing paradigms for water quality in water 4.0. So the reason why I use uh, 4.0 uh, is that it is related to the industry 4.0 paradigm with the technologies emerged uh, in the industry 4.0 paradigm, we can you harness that 
the, the powers of those technologies to improve the water quality estimation methods. So let's look at, look at uh, bottlenecks of the existing water quality measurements, measuring schemes. Um, if you uh, take a typical scenario in a country like Sri Lanka, uh, so generally uh, people go to the field and collect water samples and then they bring them to the uh, central lab where the analysis of the uh, water sample is done and then results uh, are dispersed either through emails or sometimes it may be through uh, papers uh, so that uh, uh, the, the time delay between the some collecting the sample and final outcome go to a place where decisions can be made uh, are like long, so the process is slow and then uh, it's also less penetrative in the sense that uh, the, the places where you can, uh, for laboratories where you can uh, analyze the samples are not uh, widespread. So these uh, samples has to be transported and then uh, to take samples from a remote area it takes a longer time as a result uh, the penetration is also low and the existing methods are difficult to scale because uh, if i want to multiply the number of samples tested by like 10 times uh, you need considerable amount of uh, uh, this capital in investment without that you can't do it in using the existing methods of uh, water quality measurements and then you have uh, this equipments are relatively expensive as well as uh, they need some specific chemicals in certain cases that makes it uh, relatively expensive and then uh, When it comes to integrating into decision support system, um, the existing water quality measuring schemes, if you look at them, they have a certain amount of manual uh, operations. So when you have those manual operations, which is not fully automated, uh, integrating them to the, uh, the, the decision support system is uh, somewhat difficult or sometimes uh, it may be slow and sometimes it may be error prone as well. So because of those reasons, we need another sensing paradigm for uh, water quality estimation. And then uh, I'm going to discuss the enabling techniques, technologies that drive water quality estimation in water 4.0 era. So uh, first of all, you have artificial intelligence and big data. Since 2010, with the emergence of this uh, image net, uh, the AI field has developed a lot in the artificial intelligence. Uh, what it does is uh, it tries to mimic the human brain to a certain extent uh, uh, by analyzing or using huge amount of data and then uh, you have different algorithms uh, mostly deep learning algorithms which uh, can absorb large amount of data and then uh, when it comes to a new new uh, new new image or new sample or new uh, scenario it can uh, derive the status of that sample uh, by using the, uh, the training it had with uh, previous samples so it has to be the the ai is effective if you can train it with large amount of data this ai big data uh, evolution is only possible because of the advancements in the computing power so if you look at uh, this graph since uh, 2010 the number of cores inside the uh, microprocessor uh, or CPU has like increased by 10 points. So that uh, the, uh, the 
amount of computing it can done at a sec per second has increased and also there are improvements in the number of transistors as well as uh, number of cores inside the processor so that huge computing power make it possible to process this large amount of data need to be processed in ai and then uh, you may all aware that uh, the advancements in the smartphone technology has revolutionized the way we do our business and uh, day to day businesses and that can also be also applicable to the uh, what about estimation as well so the relative performance of smartphones has uh, increased by sometimes uh, more than 10 fold since early 2000s and that includes the, the processing powers the quality of the sensors and things like that and then these new smartphones are equipped with large number of sensors so they have a huge large number of sensors and i think uh, it is prudent that we um, investigate how we can harness the powers of these sensors to make our life easier such as uh, what are called estimation uh, uh, in current era so uh, then there is internet of things uh, which integrates all this uh, uh, in one side you have this uh, smartphones and all these phones have can be uh, uh, we can have different app, mobile apps and then uh, there are different number of large number of sensors uh, available distributed and there is a communication network uh, mainly driven by fiber optics uh, which integrate all these sensors smartphones and then uh, servers and uh, other computing equipment so this uh, whole thing can be a part of a decision support system for the water quality estimation and the sixth uh, technology is uh, somewhat like different in the sense that uh, um uh, here earlier ones are specifically like multi dimensional things uh, the remote sensing we are looking at uh, like uh, imaging targets it can be through uh, satellites or through through um, drones but in this case i am specifically focusing on satellite imaging so in the like past to, to, uh, one to two decades uh, the uh, the quality of imaging that can be obtained through satellite uh, sensors has in, increased uh, to the extent that uh, it can image uh, ground targets at a special resolution of uh, half a meter in commercial satellites up to half a meter or less sometimes and then uh, the spectral resolution can go up to up to like uh, 200 plus spectral uh, spectral components so as a result um, it is it is easy it is possible to uh, uh, examine ground targets at a higher special resolution and with higher uh, chem, uh, higher spectral resolution as well with the spectral resolution we can obtain large amounts of data about the target so this six technologies combined can uh, be a part of water quality estimation in, in, in water 4.0 era so i am going to discuss several case studies here uh, the case study is what one is remote sensing based system so take a fresh water reservoir uh, where uh, you have let's say clean water but due to pollution uh, you may get uh, algal blooms inside this uh, reservoir so um, generally if you are going to use uh, water from this reservoir to, for drinking it should be purified and uh, purify purification system 
uh, it, it can be adaptive such that depending on the quality of the water, the can, amount of chemicals it is going to use can be changed. Now uh, we can also change the type of chemical as well. So uh, the purification system uh, output of the purification system is clean water. And if you can uh, have an adaptive purification system, where you um, measure the water quality, and then uh, depending on that, you can change the amount of chemicals as well as the types of chemicals. So, for a, if you are doing this for a large geographic area, uh, rather than collecting samples from each reservoir frequently, uh, if you can obtain um, satellite images of these water bodies uh, with, uh, with the large number of spectral components as well as with higher spatial resolution. And then if you de can develop uh, AI algorithms, uh, those algorithms can, uh, can uh, predict or estimate the chemical component of these water samples or water available in the reservoirs. And that information can be sent to purification systems as an early warning. And then accordingly purification can adapt, purification systems can adapt itself to uh, deliver water purification effectively. So actually these kind of things, uh, uh, at least part of it has already been done. So I would like to share some results uh, appeared in the European Journal of Remote Sensing. The title of the work is Monitoring Water Quality in Two Dam Reservoirs from Multispectral Satellite Data. So you can see that uh, the uh, in situ measurements as well as satellite estimation are very close uh, when it comes to the turbidity and SDD. And then uh, still with regard to chlorophyll A also, the values are relatively close. So uh, this proves that uh, we can actually obtain, analyze, do the chemical analysis of uh, water samples through remote sensing satellites. This is another uh, such example. This is a paper appeared in Water Journal. The title is Monitoring Coastal Chlorophyll Concentration in Coastal Areas Using Machine Learning Models. So here you can see that uh, the observed and the estimated uh, chlorophyll levels are highly correlated. And uh, so with how we can apply this system, uh, let's look at this multispectral satellite image. This is uh, the satellite image of Candy, the city where I live. And uh, so, so uh, a single shot from cat satellite can cover a huge amount, large amount of area, geographic area. That there are a large number of water bodies. So this image is around like 20 or 30 square kilometers. Uh, and the, the images has like nine spectral components at half a meter resolution. So if you uh, can develop algorithms to estimate the quality of the water using these images, uh, we can do it much faster than doing it manually and transporting samples to the to laboratories. I mean, you can easily uh, obtain the water quality parameters of this geographic area, let's say within one hour, uh, depending on the speed of the algorithms. So it depends on the uh, AI algorithm as well as computing power you use to run those algorithms. and. Uh, so it is fast and scalable because uh, satellites are uh, like large number of satellites are revolving around Earth every day, and you can um, sample or take images of the same location over and over again in like very frequent intervals. So let's go to the second case study. Uh, we are here. We are discussing about mobile device sensor-based system. As I mentioned earlier, there are a large number of sensors available in modern smartphones, including camera, uh, light sensor, thermometer, then microphone, gyroscope, accelerometer, 
magnetometer and then proximity sensor and some high-end phones have uh, infrared cameras so then uh, flood illuminator ambient light sensor and things like that so this uh, sensing uh, uh, sensors available in mobile phone can be harnessed to be a part of uh, what are called the estimation system so let's look at how it can be done so here you can see uh, initially you have to uh, illuminate the samples what samples either through sunlight or ambient light or uh, using phone flashlight or probably using halogen lamp if you are doing it in the field it should be mostly sunlight so there are three modes of uh, operation we are going to discuss in one mode uh, you send the send the light through the sample and obtain the modulated light output. And in the second method, uh, we illuminate the sample and then obtain the light generated by the sample. We call it fluorescence or fluorescence. And then the third method, we illuminate the sample and obtain the light reflected from the sample. So we call it modulated light. Then you send this modulated light through a grating element. Yeah, it can separate the input light into its spectral components and that and then that can be uh, sent to the image sensor of the mobile phone and obtain uh, the spectral signature of this uh, sample and then the spectral signature of the sample uh, actually can contains information about the chemical composition of the sample so if you have large number of samples with known chemical composition and then if you obtain those uh, the spectral signatures of those samples those spectral signatures can use to train ai modules then in turn if you get a new sample new spectral signature the ai module can predict the uh, chemical composition of this new sample. So when you take uh, consider the liquid samples, mostly we use the absorption spectroscopy where the light is passed through the uh, sample. And then uh, this is actually an implementation of such system. Uh, so you have an accessory to the mobile phone. So if you take this system, uh, you have this uh, light uh, input light uh, passing through the sample and then uh, it passes through a system of lenses and then eventually focused onto a uh, diffractive grating where the uh, the input light is separated into its uh, uh, spectral components and that that spectral signature uh, then can be pass to a external server if necessary through a mobile app and there you can actually run all those ai algorithms and uh, give an output regarding the chemical composition of the sample and then uh, the third case study the, in the if you take the earlier system the smartphone is actually a part of the sensor uh, because we use uh, smartphone camera as part of this sensing system but then you can have a case where the as given here the sensor is external and the smartphone only appears acts as a communication interface where an app is running on it and then probably this app can either generate data information generate uh, the results in the smartphone itself or it can forward that information to external server and obtain relevant information. So this is actually a very recent paper appeared on One Earth Journal. And then uh, how we can incorporate IoT system into this uh, uh, water quality estimation. So that's this like IoT system architecture of a water quality parameter estimation system. So you have smartphone based sensor which i discussed earlier so so you have multi spectral imaging system and smartphone captures images 
and then uh, there is a there can be an app running inside the smartphone which can send the images to a, a database through cloud so there is a server that runs algorithms ai algorithms so that the the server can analyze the images and uh, output the water quality parameters and then the communication is done through cloud so this forms an iot architecture uh, where we can have uh, uh, the water quality estimation system and then decision support system can be also integrated to here so you can like one way is uh, when the server obtains its information it can send the results back to the original uh, mobile phone as well as it can send uh, that information to let's say different purification plants as well as uh, people decision people who are in the decision making position position so that they are updated instantaneously and if there is any uh, like uh, irregularities or like some adverse uh, reports they can act immediately rather than waiting so uh, let's take about the advantages of these systems i discussed earlier so as uh, we can discuss uh, those methods are fast and penetrative uh, so you can actually uh, if you take smartphone based system the information can be like images can be instantaneously transferred to a central database and obtain the results very fast within let's say one minute and then with that information can be sent to multiple places so that the update is instantaneous and then uh, this can be done you don't have to have access to a like lab close by in any remote area if you have communication facilities like communication um, accessibility or coverage uh, this can be done fast and if you take the remote sensing based method uh, it is even faster because like single image or set of images taken within like a chat with like one hour can be analyzed and then uh, the raw results can be again conveyed with the coordinates to relevant places and if you take these methods uh, uh, the running cost is uh, not much once you implement this system there are no like chemical uh agents needed or physical uh, labor is also minimal as a result uh, the running cost of these systems are not very high the implementation stage there may be some cost uh, to develop algorithms and uh, to set up this communication networks and things like that so these methods are chemical free this uh, environmentally friendly So as I mentioned earlier, we can distribute the information, uh, rather information, uh, in real time, and then uh, we can have adaptive water purification systems uh, which acts upon the uh, information sent by these uh, sensing systems. So this uh, we can increase testing frequency like multifold. and uh, if you take satellite remote sensing based systems uh, they can cover large geographic area in a single shot and they can also image frequently uh, as a result uh, the testing frequency is increased and uh, the vision the systems the adaptive systems can be updated frequently so this is actually the end of my presentation um, so thank you for listening this presentation and uh, if you have any questions you can ask them in the q and a session so thank you very much thank you vijita for that uh, presentation about how you can integrate iot ai and sensors for different water applications let me quickly move on to the next presentation because we are 10 uh, nearly uh, 10 minutes behind the schedule our next speaker uh, let me also share his uh, 
then shells. Okay, uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Ranga Fernando. Uh, uh, he is an adjunct uh, principal research fellow and visiting postgraduate lecturer at RMIT, Australia. His subject matter expertise includes urban water demand modeling, hydraulic modeling, model calibration, uh, non revenue water reduction, operational technology, IoT sensors in water and storage system networks. Uh, he is a chartered professional engineer with more than 20 years of uh, civil engineering and management experience in three countries. Uh, he is uh, he's a serving member of World Water Innovation Fund and have contributed to many global water industry events organized by the International Water Association, Australian Water Association, India Australia Council and European Commission and University of Technology, Malaysia. Uh, as the founding representative of YVW RMIT, uh, I suppose it's something to do with youth, uh, integrated learning program. He has uh, supervised, uh, mentored more than 30 postgraduate uh, students. Uh, he also has been working at uh, Singapore, uh, then in Sri Lanka, uh, before he joined uh, Australia. Uh, so let me pass uh, the podium to uh, Ranga. So, Ranga, it's over to you. Ranga, we cannot hear you or see you. Some reason his uh, mic. Okay, now we, we can see you, uh, but still your mic is muted. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kanaka, for the kind introduction. Uh, can you please confirm you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, you thank go. you very much. Sorry about that uh, little uh, uh, technical issue that I was having uh, at my end. So, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizers and a special thanks to Professor uh, Jaga, uh, Jaga for this kind uh, invitation to provide the water industry perspective to this uh, timely webinar. Uh, in this presentation, um, uh, I will give a brief overview uh, about the uh, water authority that I'm representing, as well as uh, the the sensors and then the IoT platforms that that's currently used in the water industry. So uh, I'm coming from Yarra Valley Water, so I'm the distribution transformation manager there. So we service about two million customers in our Melbourne area, and um, Within our organization, there are more than 700 staffs with a 5 billion uh, water and sewerage assets uh, we manage. We are owned by the state government and uh, in Melbourne water. So we have uh, the, the structure that we have at Melbourne is slightly different to the structure that uh, in Sri Lanka, we have one wholesaler called Melbourne water who do the water collection function. And there are three water re retailers uh, in Melbourne. Out of the three water retailers, Yara Valley Water is the largest water retailer uh, serving the, the uh, eastern uh, part of Melbourne. So in our network, there are three types of services that we provide. We provide the potable water, 
we provide the recycled water and the sewerage services. Uh, as you can see from these uh, pipes and connection numbers there, both our portable and the sewerage systems are pretty mature systems with more than uh, 10,000 kilometers of uh, pipes uh, in the ground for each system. But uh, relatively, the recycled water system is relatively new concepts. So because of that thing, uh, we have much less uh, footprint when it comes to the recycled water. So uh, currently, we have about uh, 12,000 connections. And uh, the, the full recycled water system, when fully developed, should have about 140,000 connections. So um, uh, I mentioned that we are servicing about uh, 2 million customers. Uh, to service those customers, we have about uh, 800,000 uh, connections, the connections and a number of uh, pump stations and, uh, uh, and treatment plants and pressure reducing stations, tanks, so on. So I thought of giving you that little insight because uh, depending on the, uh, the size of the water authority that you're managing, some of these uh, uh, content in my presentation might be ap applicable in a slightly different way. So before I go to my, uh, my topic, I thought of just uh, quickly uh, touching some of the uh, key technology trends that is impacting the water industry uh, as a whole. So there are uh, the, the top three, the digital metering, sensors, and digital platforms are the three key ones that I'm going to uh, go into detail in my presentation today. But of course, there are a lot of other, other key, uh, key uh, uh, technology trends that you all need to be aware. Uh, Cybersecurity, as you know, uh, it is quite, quite important in, 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 in the industry. Uh, you might have heard about the USA colonial pipeline incident. So uh, there's a lot of focus currently on the cybersecurity aspects and energy and, uh, energy and emission reduction. So that is another big area. So likewise, there are like a lot of, lot of uh, other, other trends that uh, uh, impact in the water industry. But my presentation today is mainly going to touch the top three items, digital meter sensors and uh, platforms. Okay, so let, let's go and uh, try to answer that question, why the sensors are important. So when you look from the water industry point of view, or water authorities point of view, we manage about 20,000. So when you look at like my water authority or Yara Valley water where I'm working, uh, we manage about 20,000 kilometers of underground pipe network uh, and related infrastructure to service our customers, right? So from a customer service point of view, the, the service levels that we provide to the customers are quite paramount. So in order to provide those uh, uh, service levels, we need to have eyes and ears in the field. What are those eyes and ears? What, what, I, what, I, what do I mean by eyes and ears? So those are the sensors that I mean, because uh, in order to ascertain what's going in uh, those pipelines, we need to have uh, sensors there. So in the past, when we look at the, uh, the sensors, we had like two major barriers uh, as to why we can't deploy large scale sensors. So the current network that I'm managing, I have about probably less than 1,000 remote terminal units across that uh, huge network, more than 4,000 square kilometers of the network that Yara Valley would manage. Only less than 1,000 uh, remote terminal units they are sending me information. So my current SCADA system is about uh, 75,000 data points that we typically get uh, uh, 24 hours a day, right? But in the ideal world, we wanted to have more sensors and get like more information, but there were two key barriers. The sensor costs were quite high in the past, and also the communication costs were quite high as well. So within the last three, four, uh, last uh, five years or so, these two major costs have come down significantly. So when I look at uh, the sensor cost, at least uh, they have come down by tenfold. And also when it comes to the communication costs, uh, they, uh, they have come down at least tenfold as well. So this left side uh, graph that I have put is a prediction about the total I IoT devices connected, not within next 30 years or so, within this decade, by 2030, 
we are expecting about uh, 2.5 billion uh, devices worldwide. This is Gartner's prediction, uh, 3.5 billion uh, devices, uh, just in one, uh, one telecommunication category only, right? Uh, as a manager who managed the, the network currently, I'm not surprised to see these big numbers because even if I look at the, the authority that I'm in, we are currently uh, in the process of deploying or we are preparing the plans to deploy about million devices within the next 10 years. So uh, that is why I'm not uh, very surprised to see this 3.5 billion uh, figure because when I know that even just from one authority, there are million devices coming. Uh, so so this, this uh, seems quite realistic. So the, so when you're looking at uh, the sensors, um, there will be uh, different technologies that is used to get the data from these devices. So this left, left side graph, uh, there are different, different communication techniques uh, available to get that data. At the moment, there's a lot of buzzword going on the 5G communications. But when you look at the IoT sensor data, uh, my prediction, as well as this Gardner's prediction, majority of the data uh, capturing would happen in this um, something called 3GPP, that is, uh, uh, using the 3G infrastructure and to provide the NB-IoT uh, or narrow brand uh, IoT te uh, techniques to send the, send the data. And of course, the different, uh, different industry might, might, might be using uh, different communication techniques, so they might have different preferences. So if you look at this right-hand graph, you can see the utilities and government sectors and manufacturing sort of uh, industries might be using a lot of um, uh, three uh, NBIOT sort of data, uh, whereas the other 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 industries might be use, using uh, some different uh, different uh, mechanisms. So I mentioned that some of the barriers we had uh, in the past when it comes to the deployment. So just to illustrate that factor, I have at uh, some some typical cost there, right? So in the past, if I were to deploy a water pressure sensor or the sewer level, uh, level sensor in the traditional world, it might have cost us with all the excavations and everything included about fifteen thousand dollars per per deployment. And in my network, I have about 50,000 uh, shutoff blocks. So if I were to deploy one each, we are talking about $750 million. And when it comes to the sewer, side, sewer sensors, we are looking at probably $2.4 billion. So you can see how cost prohibitive these uh, old technologies were, right? But in the next couple of slides, I'll show you that why this has significantly changed and now why it is possible. So now we have answered that why we need the sensors and why, why it is possible. And what are the different sort of sensors we need in the water industry, right? So in 2017, I went to the business and asked, okay, tell me your wish list. What are the uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, sensors you need if the cost was not a problem because I knew that the, this, these cost reductions are coming, right? So there were like 120 plus different sensors that business said, if we have that thing deployed at a, uh, at, a, at a reasonable cost, that would benefit our day-to-day -day business decisions. So I have listed out of those 120 plus uh, uh, sensors, I have listed some of the sensors that we will need in the uh, water, portable water network. And there were a lot of sensor requirements in the sewer, sewer side of the things. When it comes to the sewer hydraulics, sewer uh, uh, liquid uh, state, gas state, as well as the asset status and the environment and uh, uh, mechanical and ele electrical monitoring space. Um, so out of all those different sensors, because of course, when, when, you're, when you are a regulated uh, uh, authority, you can't, uh, probably start implementing uh, all the 127 different types of sensors, right? So we have to go through like a prioritization process and identify what are, what are the most important sensors that we, we are going to deploy within the next, uh, next 10, 10 years uh, time, right? So out of all these things, the number one uh, sensor that we are planning to do is deploy is uh, digital meters. This is not just Yara Valley Water's point of view, 
currently there are a lot of water authorities in Australia uh, who are trying, who are in the process of deploying digital meters uh, at, at, at their uh, at, at their customers' uh, properties, right? So that is the number one priority. And then the second one is the pressure sensors. So at Yarra Valley Water, we are envisaging. I mentioned that uh, we have about fifty thousand uh, shutoff blocks. For the people who don't know what the shutoff block is, just think it as uh, you have that whole uh, network. Uh, uh, 10,000 kilometers of pipe networks uh, divided into a very small areas and that the smallest module is probably a shutoff block. Typically, uh, uh, each shutoff block should have about uh, 25 to 50 customers in the, in the ideal world, right? So we are planning to deploy a pressure sensor at each shutoff block. And then the sewer level sensors, uh, these sewer level sensors will go in the manholes at Yara Valley Water Network, we have about 220,000 manholes. We are not envisaging to go there and put a, a sewer sensor at each manhole. We are thinking probably one in every four manhole will uh, require a, a, a sensor there. And um, part of our network is called, uh, we have pressure sewer systems. Um, and uh, we are envisaging there will be about uh, 30,000 pressure sewer systems in our network. Uh, and we will, we will have some um, IoT sensors connected with uh, those, those systems. And also one other big problem uh, most of the water authorities currently have are uh, our valves. The, the status of the valves are not known. So we initially was envisaging that uh, we will have valve status monitoring sensors in, in, the, in each and every valve. Uh, the current thinking has slightly changed. So there, there, there's a possibility that we might be able to uh, uh, manage without a sensor on each wire uh, with, with uh, some bit better, better processes, but there's a possibility that we might go there and deploy a uh, large number of wire sensors as well. And then similar to the di this digital metering, the large customers will have a similar but slightly different uh, mechanism. Water quality monitoring is a very big, uh, big uh, area in, in, in the industry at the moment, particularly because uh, last year we had a big water quality incident in Melbourne. And because of that thing, our regulator, as well as uh, the, the uh, Department of Health is uh, pushing to have more uh, real time water quality monitoring in the network uh, in, in the coming, coming years. And also the non-revenue water is another big topic in the water industry. And uh, the, the, there are some um, uh, water uh, non-revenue water uh, sensors that we are planning to put in the, in the field. Um, and I, I heard a lot of things about like, what are the things that we can do in the, in the IoT sensor space? But when you're looking from a big water authority's point of view, every day there are a lot of people coming to us and saying, we have a sensor for you. We have a sensor for you. We have a sensor for you. But when we, yeah, when the industry select a sensor, there are a number of key, key criteria that we have to make sure, right? Uh, when it comes to the IoT sensors, the production and uh, installation costs should be very, very minimal. So we are not talking about those traditional fifteen thousand uh, dollar installations. We are talking about probably in the range of $100 sort of thing. So, so it might be maximum $500 uh, depending on the sensor that you are looking at. But for, for the things like uh, 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 really big uh, deployments, we are, we are probably looking at around $100, right? And one other big, uh, big issue that water industry has, which the electricity industry didn't have, is the battery life. Because in the electricity industry, when they are deploying their smart meters, of course, they didn't have a power problem because they, they, they were connected to power, right? But in the water industry, uh, the, the battery life is like gold. So you have to make sure the uh, your, your design life is uh, our, our target or the ideal world. We would like to have 15 year design life. And some cases that is not practical, but 
we probably won't look at a sensor unless it has more than eight year battery life. So that is, uh, so ideal is 15, but uh, the minimum probably uh, eight years at least. And low power wide area communication capabilities. I, I touched a couple of them. So it's very important the, the whatever the sensor that you're coming up with uh, is using low power. So in that way, the battery, battery is not impacted uh, significantly, right? And then the monitoring frequencies we are talking about, it should probably uh, one, one, one minute, uh, every minute uh, that um, they should be able to monitor at least. And then the data transfer, because of the battery uh, life issue we have, we typically get the IoT sensor data once a day, but under the alarming conditions, it have, have the ability to send the data uh, instantaneously. So as soon as the alarming condition is reached. Right? And because we are talking about deploying uh, close to million devices, you won't be uh, have the luxury of like sending somebody to do the calibration or change the firmware. So we need to have that uh, over the air uh, calibration capabilities as well as uh, firmware upgrade capabilities. And sensing accuracy we are looking at probably one to 2% in that range. And also when you are looking, putting something in the system, there are a lot of uh, uh, ratings and certifications that we need to get and uh, all the sensors that anybody planning to come up with uh, for, for the voting industry, we will require those certifications. Say for an example, if you're putting something in the in our sewer network, uh, it, it has to uh, 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 get, get, get the, the um, fire rating and, and so on because there are some combustible ga gas in that environment. And, um, and this slide shows you like, what are, what are the key things that you need to think when you are looking at the architecture? Because there are a number of layers that you need to think. Uh, if you are a sensor uh, production area or research area, you need to think about like uh, 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 when we are looking from the industry per perspective, uh, there are at the device level, what are the things that you need to do at the communication level and uh, at the uh, and then the data integration as well as this process. So you can see that some of these things are pretty common to each layer. Say for an example, security and interfacing is quite common to e each layer, but at the same time, the, there are some other things that is specific for, for uh, for that particular layer, right? So the, the left-hand one is based on the Gartner research, how, how, what the uh, digital reference framework will look like. And then the right-hand one is particularly developed for the water industry by uh, the IoT Alliance in Australia. And it's a draft uh, a draft stage at the, uh, currently it is at the draft stage. And, um, most of the things that I'm talking about here are not like at the research level, we have already deployed or at least start deploying these things. So for an example, we have a area called Vermont South Smart Precinct area. So we have deployed uh, about 1,500. Yara Valley water own a uh, digital meter there. So, uh, uh, and we have, the, uh, we were talking about large customer metering. So about 50 large uh, uh, captive devices. And we have developed our own uh, apps uh, for, so that the customers can get their water usage uh, uh, instantaneously. Uh, uh, and then if there is any leak or anything like that happening, they can, they can take the necessary actions, right? Uh, when I prepare this thing, a uh, couple of people asked me to put um, what, what are the, what, how, how you look at a business case uh, de development when it comes to the IoT sensor. So when we look at the business, um, when we are developing a business case, uh, the place that we start is the cost of water, right? I mean, compared to Sri Lanka, the, in, in Australia, the cost of water is quite high uh, for valid reasons, because in Melbourne, the average waterfall is about 650 millimeters. So we don't have a lot of water. So that is why uh, we, we, uh, the water is quite precious here. So uh, in my left-hand side, uh, this is a typical uh, 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 extract from a typical uh, typical household uh, water bill. So you can see about $325 uh, every, uh, uh, every uh, three months uh, that you have to pay. Um, from that one, you can see the, the water charge is about, um, so as you can see per kilometer, kiloliter, it's about uh, two to three, $3, right? So um, 
So if we can use the sensors to uh, either reduce the water consumption or reduce the water wastage or delay any big capital deployments that will uh, 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 help the, the business case development. Say for an example, right? At the moment, Yarrava, uh, Melbourne have a big desalination plant, which costs like billions of dollars. So if we can uh, save the existing precious water and delay the second desalination plant, that will uh, reduce the customer bills significantly. And that is why uh, when we are looking at the business case development, we typically uh, look, look at things like uh, 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 the cost saving, due to the deferral of the infrastructure. And not only that, I mentioned that we are a regulated uh, uh, authority. So uh, we have key KPIs to uh, meet. Say for an example, when it comes to the uh, quality of the water, the target is 100%, not, not anything like 99 or anything like that. You have to comply 100%. And also you can see all the other KPIs are pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, tight as well. Say for an example, if we, uh, miss the, any of these targets, say for example, uh, if, if we had more than 1% of our customers experiencing more than three water storage services interruptions, uh, we have to pay a penalty of $1.5 million for every year. For, so each missed target here in the right-hand side will cost the authority $1.5 million. So that is, those are the things that we would consider when we are developing a business case uh, for the IoT sensors. <clears throat> so now I'm moving into the, the platforms area. So typically in the past, what we have used is uh, SCADA as our uh, data acquisition uh, platform. But these are like really robust systems. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the SCADA systems because I, I, I trust most of the audience is pretty familiar about SCADA systems because they have been there uh, since 1970s. The key message that I want to give, uh, give here, when it comes to the IoT platforms, they are, not, they are not like mature systems like SCADA because they are like quite uh, relatively new. Uh, so when it comes to the uh, IoT platform, there are a number of different um, uh, functions we are trying to get from uh, IoT platform like uh, device management, data management, uh, deployment management, because when you are deploying million devices in the field, we need to make sure there are proper systems in place to manage that data. So if any authority or anybody is considering um, deploying large number of sensors, you need to think about how you are going to get that data and how you are going to manage. There are two, uh, two uh, uh, key different ways available. Are you going to manage it by, uh, by yourselves or are you going to rely on a service provider? So the right hand side, uh, I have given like top providers into uh, in both, both, both categories. So if you are talking about IoT uh, platforms managed by yourself, the, the, the key, key providers are listed in this uh, uh, top diagram. But if you're looking at uh, the managed services, uh, the, 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 the bottom diagram sh shows that one. So, so say for example, in Yara Valley Water's case, we are using Vodafone as our uh, IoT uh, service provider. Um, and, but if you're going to do it yourself, I, I'm aware about a couple of our sister organizations, they are going to develop, manage their uh, IoT platform by themselves. And uh, they are using uh, things like, um, Microsoft to build those platforms. And then the other, the other platform that I mentioned, so once you get the data from the field, you need to uh, uh, deploy those data to your planners and operators and so on, right? So it's very important to think about that, that area as well. So in the past, like uh, two years back, we did a portfolio analysis at Yara Valley Water. We had 150 plus different applications. So what does that mean? So if we are expecting our operator or a planner, they need to be familiar with like num number of different platforms, right? So or, or number of different applications. We are trying to move out of that one. What we are trying to do is uh, to provide a single pane of glass. They don't have to be expert in any, any of these IoT platforms or the SCADA system or anything like that. 
there should be like one single pane of glass where they can go there and uh, get the data. We call it as our uh, operational platforms or the distribution management system. So uh, even though this is a kind of a mature, mature systems in the electricity industry, for water industry, these are quite new. Uh, so we have just completed uh, our tendering process for our distribution management system. So we are moving to uh, our last slide. So we were talking about like different, different um, uh, systems and sensors. So how we combine all those things together. Uh, this is a little bit of crowded uh, slide, but I try to give you that full perspective, right? So um, this, the data start with, uh, so let me uh, use my pointer, this pointer, yeah. So the data start with, uh, all the sensor data coming from uh, this right hand side using different different communication met methods. I mentioned that uh, NB-IoT or 3G, 4G, 5G, whatever the communication methods, sending the data to, the, to our uh, IoT platform and then using our distribution management system to provide that insight to the customers, developers, employees. Initially, when we were planning this thing, we thought we should be able to get a, one, one application to provide that full insight. But unfortunately, the practicality was we couldn't uh, get just one. So we had to, we have to have like uh, two different uh, platforms. So at this stage, we are, we are looking at, at the front end uh, facing, there are two different platforms. So one is the distribution management system, and then the other is the customer experience uh, management platform. And uh, then one other thing that you all, uh, so the, the, the sensor developers or the uh, product manufacturers need to be aware about how you are going to provide that data because quite often we hear that people come into us and say, uh, Ranga, we have the coolest uh, 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 cloud-based uh, data platform for our sensor, right? But just think from the water in water in authorities point of view, right? So it is quite possible the water authority will need to use like number of different sensors from different providers. And if I were to use like a separate platform from each and every window, my operators and my planners will end up with like 20 or 30 or 50, 50 different uh, cloud based platforms that is not sustainable for the water industry uh, from the authorities point of view, right? So that is why you all need to think about uh, not only having that cool platform or, or, or the da data, uh, data visualization uh, uh, in, in cloud, but how you can get that data uh, integrated to the water authorities systems uh, using a API layer or application uh, programming interface layer. So, so, um, so in the past, we were, we were using all these things, uh, the, the core systems uh, to de deliver the data, uh, display the data to our operators and planners, but we are trying to move away from that practice because that is quite costly, customizing our SCADA system or asset management system or our geospatial system to provide the data. So it will uh, sit uh, underneath and provi uh, provide the uh, key information and then uh, the, the, our customers and our employees will, will uh, use these customer facing uh, um, platforms to get the data. And one other key uh, thing that I will highlight here is our historian product. So we are in the process of deploying our uh, enterprise historian uh, to manage all our time series data that that's, uh, that we get from our through our IoT platform as well as uh, um, as well as our SCADA system. So. Uh, and just to mention a couple of names, because if, if any of you are wondering what sort of uh, uh, applications that we are using. So our current SCADA system is uh, Snyder Electric. So if any of you are familiar about the SCADA system providers, Snyder Electric. Our asset management system is IBM Maximo. Our geospatial system is uh, based on Hexagon. And we currently use Oracle uh, billing system. Um, and our enterprise historian going to be uh, OSI Pi and people familiar with the enterprise historians know those uh, products. Our distribution management system is going to be uh, developed by KPMG uh, called Arvin. 
and our customer experience platform is going to be uh, uh, Salesforce. So, so this is how, uh, how we are envisaging uh, the, all the platforms combining together to, to provide the necessary data to our staff as well as the customers. So hope uh, in this uh, quick presentation, I have managed to give you a bit of insight uh, into uh, the sensors and platforms uh, used in the water industry. And if you have any questions, uh, yeah, feel free to contact me uh, via my email address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for pro providing a practical uh, sense to this uh, um, sem say webinar. Uh, so um, while thanking all three presenters for their wonderful presentations, let me move on to the Q&A session. Uh, so if you still have questions, please do write on the, on the uh, uh, chat uh, area. Uh, so uh, uh, let me uh, kick this off with a question to uh, Professor Anand Mitchell. Uh, I'm sure Anand is waiting uh, there. Sorry, sorry if we are getting no, no, I'm here. I'm here. Yep. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm working on the, the, the floating solar PV systems. And uh, one of the concerns the environmentalists are having is uh, the, you know, the, the water quality inside the, the areas where, which are covered by these floating solar uh, and, and the, the impact on uh, flora and fauna. Now, how do you think that the sensors could help uh, there? So, so um, <clears throat> I think we'd probably need to work with, you know, some sort of marine biologist to discover what were the important markers to measure. But you could measure, for example, you know, oxygen and carbon dioxide in the water. You could measure... Um, you know, any algae um, or, or any other sort of uh, markers that might um, indicate that there are, you know, microbes in distress. Um, but, but I think that, that, that really, um, this, is, this is the way we work with biosensors is that we, you know, pick eight things that, that might be of relevance to a particular disease and just measure them all and then use some algorithm to decide, okay, what is the percentage chance of there being a disease? And particularly also being able to compare the, you know, uh, say a panel of 10 different markers in the, in the ocean under the solar panel with 10 that are not under the solar panel and just say, okay, is it different whether we you know, you know, whether the consequences are significant or not, or, you know, at least you would know there was something that was different. But I would, I would think straight off the top of my head that um, carbon dioxide and oxygen would give you a fair idea of, um, you know, the impact on organisms in the environment. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. There are a couple of questions for Vijita. Uh, Vijita, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, the, there's a question from uh, there are a couple of questions from Primal Veer Singh. Uh, Primal Lee. Uh, she's asking, what is the platform used to apply AI algorithm for multispectral images to get the water quality? And the second question is, what are the multispectral image, images uh, can use and their cost? Uh, I mean, you can very briefly yeah, yeah. answer both questions, please. Yeah, and with regard to platforms, uh, generally you can use uh, like uh, platforms like TensorFlow, Keras, or PyTorch, uh, which are static platforms uh, uh, that can be applied to any generic uh, application. But then uh, like as far as our group is concerned, we are developing our own algorithms uh, to cater to our own needs for, and then uh, apply them to general applications, that is whatever we think we can do. And with regard to the uh, multispectral images, I think there are two types. One is satellite images, and other one is like uh, normal images taken through uh, ground-based instruments. If you take satellite images, uh, some images can, some multispectral images can be obtained free of charge, uh, such as if you take, for example, the, uh, the research paper I described with regard to the water quality in uh, this uh, 
dam reservoirs in Europe. Those images were obtained from a Sentinel satellite, uh, and those images are actually free. And uh, the good thing is that they take uh, these uh, images regularly over a certain uh, coordinate of the Earth, uh, and that and it covers like whole Earth almost. And, uh, and some are actually you have to pay some. It costs some money. For example, the image I showed you with regard to the Candy, Candy City, uh, that one, like if you take a 70 square kilometer area, it costed around 200,000 rupees per image. And with regard to the uh, ground based instruments, uh, I cannot exactly give you an idea about the cost. Uh, it depends on the instrument you are using. I mean, you can buy standard instruments which are very kind of expensive, uh, but uh, our target is to actually to uh, build more economical multispectral imaging systems which can be utilized for this purpose. So thank you. So, thanks, thanks Vijita. Uh, Ranga, I'm going to move on to you. Um, let me uh, ask a question like, I have been working on the smart metering for electrical systems. Uh, uh, so, one of the questions everybody is asking, do we need real-time data? At what frequency the data should be sent to the meter management system? You know, these are the kind of questions, I think, like uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, particularly with the limited bandwidth we have, uh, that is one of the key questions we should answer. So what's your uh, you know, thoughts about that? Yes. Yeah. I can easily answer that one, uh, Professor Kanayaka, because at Yara Valley Water, when we we are in the process of deploying this thing, so we uh, the data uh, data capturing fre frequency is every minute, so it's logging the data every minute, right? But they don't send the data every minute to us because that will drain the battery. So only once a day, only we will get the data. But if the digital meter is going into alarming condition due to some reason, say for example, there's a question I can see here about the theft, right? So we have a temper detection uh, capabilities within the digital meter itself. So that's an, uh, one alarming conditions. There are like that, there are a number of alarming conditions. So if that goes to that condition, it can send the auto, auto, automatically data uh, as soon as it reach, reach uh, because you don't have to wait uh, till the next day to send that data. But uh, under the normal operating conditions, uh, data will be sent ev every day. But that is Yara Valley Water approach. At the same time, I know there are some one, couple of other water authorities who have gone to different different approaches. Okay, thanks, Ang. And you have already picked up the question which is on the chat box. So I don't think that we should uh, spend more time. Uh, I mean, uh, in in electrical system, I mean, one of the problems which may you may not have is the you know the uh, very uh, frequent power outages that we have here. So in our electrical meters, we send what we call the last gasp message, which is telling the electricity is gone. Do we have similar system in water? I mean, maybe that will be useful in countries like Sri Lanka, uh, where the, the there are frequent power, uh, power outages and you will lose data for some time. So there is no connection between our uh, our digital water meter and the electricity meter uh, at okay. this stage. So that is not a uh, message. That is one of the problem. I mean, one of the biggest issue we have with the our digital motor, uh, water meter is the power supply was the best way. And we are currently uh, doing that thing through uh, uh, batteries. Uh, okay, all right. Okay, you use batteries. Okay, thanks, Ranga. Uh, I mean, I really can't see any other questions on the chat box, uh, and uh, we are almost. Uh... Uh, actually, uh, yeah. So there is one question with regard to the uh, this uh, cloud cover when you take satellite remote sensing. Um, All right, I, I so, didn't pick yeah, uh, yeah, that. Okay, yeah. please. So I mean, uh, so that is actually an issue when you take uh, satellite images. Uh, cloud cover is an issue. When we do our work, we normally tend to obtain images. With the minimal cloud cover. There are algorithms to eliminate uh, the cloud cover, but uh, when you eliminate the cloud cover, whatever the target on that area, it's difficult to obtain. So one other option would be to use uh, like uh, drones in, in collaboration with satellite images so that we can get a better uh, information. 
Okay, thanks, Vijita. So we are only, I mean, we have, we picked up the time, we are 10 minutes behind. So let me pass the microphone to Professor uh, Jaga, uh, Jagadishan. Uh, he's a professor of environmental engineering, director of water, effective technologies and tools at uh, RMIT Australia. He is going to propose the word of thanks. Jaga, over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Janaka Ekanayaka. Um, uh, yes, um, I would like to start why we wanted this webinar. Um, maybe quickly I can go through. Maybe our concern is the population growth, urbanization, and the climate change. These are all around the globe, and uh, they are posing serious threats to many aspects of our environment. And uh, one of the uh, uh, consequences is the diminishing of uh, fresh water. So, uh, so straight away, conserving the fresh water and pra practicing integrated water management is becoming increasingly important. So the major consumers of water are agricultural sector, followed by domestic and municipal uh, users, and also the industries. So this webinar series is actually was designed to focus on industrial water and wastewater management. This is to engage the industries and the researchers from the universities and also other research uh, organizations. Uh, this way, we can create a dialogue as well as develop collaborative actions. So this is our main aim. Uh, the webinars, see, webinars, there were five webinars in this series and uh, it, uh, they covered the following topics. The first one was industrial integrated water management then the application of membrane bioreactors for wastewater treatment and reuse, rainwater harvesting, and stormwater slash groundwater management, desalination of brackish water and seawater, cleaner production, zero liquid discharge, and today water 4.0. So I feel that uh, we have achieved our purpose, but this is the beginning. Uh, so we wanted to keep the momentum going forward uh, by organizing follow-up actions. So we will prepare a report of this webinar series. So that will be available to the public and we are seeking your feedback to direct our follow-up actions in the right direction. So we would like to thank the three organizers. The first one is JRDC, that is Joint Research and Demonstration Center for Water Technology in uh, Peradeniya, University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka. The second one is the Faculty of Engineering uh, at the University of Peradeniya uh, through the NSF and NSFC project. They are working on the series. And the third one is uh, the VET Center, Water Effective Technologies and Tools Research Center at RMIT University um, uh, in Australia. So the, uh, the, the organizers were providing us, we are thanking them for providing us this wonderful opportunity. We also thank the International Relations Office, University of Peradeniya for supporting and uh, supporting uh, and coordinating the webinar. And the Lanka Education and Research Network for providing the webinar facility. Uh, many thanks go to all the speakers for your wonderful uh, presentations and great insight into issues related to water and discuss water and discussions on possible solutions. And thanks to the moderators for keeping the webinars alive. Um, Professor Shamin Jinadasa was instrumental to this webinar series and he is well aided by Dr. Sujitra Vera. Special thanks to Dinushri Samarajiva and her team for their uh, tireless work in running this webinar series seamlessly. Uh, so, uh, Dinushi mentioned she was very nervous about uh, all this uh, webinar series. It's online webinars, and we are not very sure when that uh, uh, the, the internet can break down. But unfortunately, nothing went wrong. It was seamless. Um, last but not least, a very big thank you to the audience for your active participation. Uh, we look forward to taking this task further and making Sri Lanka a model island for all the island nations as well as other nations around the world 
in implementing industrial water and wastewater management. I hope we can do that. So once again, I thank you all and have a nice day. Thank you, Professor Dega. Thank you, Dega, for that. Uh... Okay. Dinush, do you want to say any words before we conclude or? Uh, um, I would like to thank all of you uh, for being here today. And I think we can conclude the webinar series now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody.